what I wanted to say to you was that the time that I saw you was for the Womack tribute in 19. Oh, wow. And it was amazing. I went up to Cleveland oh, to see thank it. Thank you. You had a great time. You, oh, thank you. You smiled so much. end to end. <laughs> I, I just remember, uh, I remember being so shocked when the stage manager came over and was like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was like, What? Yeah. I thought you said I had 90. It was like, No, no it was only 60. I'm like, uh, We still got like four more songs left. Uh, <laughs> you know what always happens, though? The crowd never knows what's happening. Right. You right, know? Right. <laughs> As you know, it happens in radio, too. Yes, that's right. That's right. Now, I, you know, I happen to know that you're going to be talking to one of my associates from WZUM in a little bit. Uh, I think you're going to talk to Scott soon about jazz deep. Right. So I'm going to do other things that are peripheral. And, uh, and, and so uh, one of the things, uh, what I, you know, one thing I want to hear from you, I want you to tell my listeners about your nine year old epiphany. And oh, that... about, uh, w- well, which one playing the bass? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, my father, Lee Smith played with the great Cuban legend, Mongo Santa Maria for many, many years. And, uh, I saw my dad play with Mongo quite a bit and I really enjoyed it, but it never interested me to, uh, play the bass until this one particular concert. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie was a guest soloist with the band that night. Yes. And uh, I don't know why, but just that one particular night, it finally hit me. And uh, I thought, I think I want to try to play the electric bass like dad. Yeah. And uh, so later that year, uh, I got my first electric bass for Christmas and it's been a lifelong love affair. Now, the other thing that interested me is, you know, you mentioned in an interview that I was paying attention to getting ready for you today was that you had an uncle involved in radio. Now, that's you right. didn't mention that that's how you ended up in radio, but I wondered if that was your first spark, that knowing what he did got you a little bit, because you said you might have gotten interested in radio if you hadn't gotten interested in in musicianship, right. and now you've right. ended up with both, because right. your NPR show is, you know, huge and amazing, oh, and uh, you, I, I just wondered if, if that was the other spark for you. Well, my uncle, his name was Tony McBride. He he wasn't an on-air personality. He was a uh, promotions and advertising manager. But I figured you were in the building. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I, I found it quite fascinating because uh, growing up listening to my mom and my uncle and certain family members drop all these names about these famous DJs, it never occurred to me like these people were like, really important <laughs> yes yes yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then of course the older i got and i started putting two and two together i thought man you know my uh my, i met that guy georgie woods before you know I, I met that guy you know uh butterball you yes. know all these legendary philly guys and uh uh i actually didn't really get i don't, I don't know if i had any real interest in being in radio i found it fascinating but i had no interest in being in radio until the late great marion mcpartland uh who had her show piano jazz for many many years uh i I was a guest on her show many times uh toward the end of her life when her health really started to decline yes she asked me to step in as her guest host for a couple of episodes and it was there where i thought Hmm. Okay. This is actually not not too bad. And uh, the final straw came when um, I got asked to fill in. I don't know how I got asked to do this. I I still don't know. But uh, I got asked to sit in for John Schaefer, who had a show called Soundcheck on WNYC Hmm. in New York. And... um, it was a music show, but it it was all encompassing. You know, you had to do news leads, you had to do the whole nine, you had to read the weather and all of that stuff. And so he went on vacation and I got asked 
to sub for him as host. And I went, are you kidding me? You know, so I, when I had to go on live New York radio in the middle of the afternoon, that was a certain type of pressure that I had never felt before in my whole life, you know? And uh, they brought me up there to WNYC and, you know, they gave me the script and, you know, uh, hey, if yeah. you need to talk to the producer, you press this button, you know, for the callers, we'll give it to you. You press this button, here's your laptop and we'll send you messages. And I'm going, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm generally not the kind of guy that gets that nervous. But they said, uh, you know, okay, we're going live 10, 9, 8. And I mean, I'm thinking, I'm going to be on New York radio live at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, my God, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a heart attack right here on air, you know. <laughs> but, See, the interesting thing about that is you, you're in front of thousands of people. Yeah. But it's that blank in front of you where you imagine that there were millions in the case of that station there are millions right 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 uh, but they're not right in front of you it's really your imagination telling you that they are there right right <laughs> and i had to like one day i had to interview kareem abdul jabbar uh another day i had to interview the great actress essie Payton merkerson mm -hmm. and so um oh, I love and, you know and then i had to read these i had to read these news leads about uh, about putin and stuff i mean so like it was just like <laughs> wow <Yeah. laughs> like, and after that was over uh npr uh asked about me hosting jazz night in america that was a path that you did not know you were on yet until it happened exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> i want to talk about musical butterflies now because you 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 said some things that intrigued me about musicians who you thought would you know be like Rrr. and then they said no you just play yeah you know i think chick korea was one of them yes where it was much more relaxed and free form and inviting than you thought oh i but i also came across quite a large number of of grumbly musicians okay. as well but, okay uh, okay uh yes chick was always um very giving very open uh and, and and i think it was um I, I think most great musicians do this like oftentimes when i would play with chick roy haynes would be the drummer mm -hmm. and like you know what are you going to tell roy haynes roy haynes is one of the legends you know right. so oftentimes even though it was chick's group many times he would defer to roy you know uh like, Roy, what do you think of this? Is this cool? Do we need to change it? And mm -hmm. I, I just always felt that his level of respect for people in his group, that was, uh, I thought that was rare. Mm -hmm. But then there were other times where, I mean, when Chick put together like a young band, he put together a group called Vigil, mm -hmm. and he hadn't quite settled on the bass player yet. And so he said, look, you know, if you wouldn't mind, can you come out on the road with me for a couple of weeks? until I get a permanent bass player set up in this band. I said, Any, anything for you, Chick. And now I'm watching him interact with these younger musicians. He was a little more hands-on. Oh, oh, okay. Them, you know, okay. and uh, not, not in a mean way at all, but he was very, you know, like, I need you to do this like this, you know. And it was just kind of interesting to watch, you know, how he interacted with different types of, you know, musicians i was like oh okay i see now that you are where you are what are you like i now am traveling with my first millennial slash gen z band okay. uh i have now officially become uncle christian uh <laughs> the first band i've ever had where like i can't go and have like a grown-up conversation with somebody in the band after the gig is over you know <laughs> I now have to be, I now have to be Uncle Christian, you know, and uh, I got to admit, man, I love it. I love it a lot. Um, I've never been a taskmaster. I've always found that, particularly with playing jazz, um, the more you can let people make their contribution, the better the music is. So I definitely have 
I have a concept and a sound in mind for my band. Yes. But if I like people to make their contribution because I want them to feel like they're not just following orders. But if they play something I don't think fits, I'll let them know, you know. But I also let I like to give them room to make contributions, you know. Tell me about the Philly experience because we all look in and see everything happens in your place from end to end and you have you have experienced it all and influenced it all and involved everybody describe it i appreciate that uh you said the philadelphia experience i mean you know i feel i feel very fortunate coming from what is known as the city of brotherly love not sure that's really the truth but uh (laughs) I I can say that because I'm from there, but um, Philadelphia, of course, is a city with such a deep legacy and deep tradition. You never really had to go very far to find great music, you know, to find all this great culture in that town. And it, and it, it could be music from across the board. There were great rock bands, great funk bands, great jazz musicians, one of the most celebrated symphony orchestras in the world. So uh it was a great place to grow up and it's also one of the last cities that has dedicated itself to music education which is why philly every generation keeps you know there's more there's a new crop of really great musicians that keep showing up and uh i was fortunate to go to high school with quest love and black thought from the roots the late great joey d francesco Kurt Rosenwinkel, Boys to Men, we all went to the same school at the same time. So not only did we grow up in a great city, but we grew up in a great city during a great time period. So uh, I'm just really fortunate that uh, that that's the case. Philly's, uh, Philly's yeah. a wonderful place. You've mentioned education a few times um, in this discussion, and I know you give a lot of credit to your wife for Jazz House Kids but you're in it too. And you well, wanted to be there. <laughs> what yeah, inspired I mean, you to care about this future generation or is it self-evident? I feel that my path would have been a lot different had musicians like, now I'm not even talking about the local Philly legends, but like people who passed through Philly, like Wynton Marcellus and the late, great Max Roach, Dr. Billy Taylor, Grover Washington Jr., Kenny Barron. What I know now about being on the road, um, they didn't have to take time from their busy day to come and talk to us, you know. Oftentimes, they wouldn't even play. They would just come and hang out. And, I mean, like, imagine sitting in a room with Max Roach for an hour, and he's telling us stories about Charlie Parker. Like, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. and so, like, that had a direct effect on all of us. Like those great legends would take the time to, to give to us. So I made a pact to myself way back then. If I'm ever in that same position, it's a no brainer. You got to give it back. Let's talk about, uh, well, we're not going to go through the list of all of the projects, all of the groups that you've been in or have formed or whatever. But what my question is, what are you bringing to Pittsburgh? Because I don't know yet, and I haven't dug deeply, but I want a little secret. No, it's okay. All right. It's okay. Nobody knows yet. Oh, oh. Uh, It's it's that new all-millennial band I was telling you about. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. uh, I'm so excited by these young musicians. Uh, I have this great drummer. Her name is Savannah Harris. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's originally from Oakland, and she's been one of the working as drummers all around New York for the last few years. She's also been working with Kenny Barron, uh, among some other great people. Uh, A young brother by the name of Mike King is playing piano and keyboards. He's been working with Dee Dee Bridgewater a little bit, Mm -hmm. and also with the trumpeter Theo Croker. Mm -hmm. Uh, A young man on guitar by the name of Eli Perlman. Eli, I met through my summer program in Aspen, Colorado, uh, he was just such an incredible guitar player. I said, hey man, uh, I need your phone number. 
And uh, so we've been working together for about a year and a half now. And Nicole Glover plays saxophone. And uh, she's been one of the hottest musicians on the scene also for a few years. She also plays in the super group Artemis. And oh, so man. she's been zigzagging back and forth between my band and Artemis. And so uh, yes. that's the band I'll, I'll be touring with for pretty much all of this year. 